Welcome back to our conversation between Major General Huttmacher and Colonel Zachrell. The conversation continues into the key principles of IO and empowering leadership. Let's, I would, I would be interested in your thoughts on how do we actually plan and conduct information operations? What are the critical steps, principles, things like that? Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, so, uh, first off, you know, the I want to make sure that everybody understands. I am, I was an influence or cognitive side information operations um, specialist, for lack of a better term. I am. Uh, I do have some technical training. Um, you know, like NPS was kind enough to let me learn a lot about cyber while I was there by uh, letting me work with the good folks at Microsoft. But um, really, my my focus was on. Uh, those I, I.O. activities that focused on shaping perceptions and ultimately driving behavior. Um, but in general, um, there's, there's really, there's four critical steps that I view um, as essential uh, to conducting information operations. Um, the first is, and then that's defining objectives uh, and really laying out your, um, your desired uh, end states and effects. Um, the second one is, is defining or identifying, defining, um, and analyzing your target audiences. You have to know who, uh, who is the right audience to speak to in, in influence activities, and you have to really know them, and know them at a level that I, oftentimes people don't appreciate. Um, the, sec, or the, or the, the third one is uh, walking through and selecting the right tools uh, and mediums to apply um, to reach those audiences and or block that audience's access to another form of information that may be uh, uh, counter to, to your uh, objectives. And the final one is assessing. Um, and I can't beat the drum hard enough about this. Assessing is an essential step, both during execution and um, after or post execution uh, for this. It's, it, is, it is much more a, of a developed process than what people standardly or standard think about with BDA. Um, you know, people want to look at battle damage assessment or try and make it analogous to battle damage assessment. But you've got to be doing assessment both before you act, during your actions to adjust, and then after you have completed it to see if you achieved your desired end state. So if we want to unpack each one of those in turn, um, defining, the obje or the, defining the objectives and the desired effects, uh, it's, it in some respects is not that much different than other military planning. You start with your operational objective. What is it you're trying to do? What is it the commander needs us to get done? Um, then, you know, really laying out your intermediate, um, your intermediate objectives. Now, um, oftentimes the higher level, or the higher you go in information operations, the more intermediate, or the more, by the way, the more complex the behavior you're going, you're asking for, the more intermediate objectives you're going to have to have to build in um, and so you really have to think those things through but those become your pacing actions as you move through uh, an information operation execution um, then additionally uh, the, the as I mentioned um, you can also fuse an information operations objective into an overall traditional military operation you should never forget that they don't have to st stand alone and oftentimes um, some of that was you know on you know the fault of the information operations guys, but also the fault of the conventional planners and that they would tell the IO guys, go off in your corner uh, and do your thing. And, you know, we'll, we'll build our plan here. And oftentimes what you had was an information camp or an information um, or a series of information objectives that were not synchronized or not integrated into their own um, conventional operation plan or traditional operations plan. Uh, and that's, that's a recipe for disaster, quite frankly. That's where you get things like the Red Wedding, where nobody thought that through. Now, I, I because I came out of the information operations community, I, I believe that's a failing on our part. The first thing that I would do as a commander was hit the ground and read my own commander's objectives, and then go and tell him how I was going to support him. Lay in, either, here are my objectives to get your objectives accomplished. And frequently, unfortunately, oftentimes what happened was, um, not with not with this, but when if you don't do that as an IO professional, you walk in and let yourself be put off in the corner. Uh, you're just off doing IO shit. Pardon my expression. <laughs> and, um, the that's not helpful. Um, it's it's desynchronized. Um, 
So after you, but after you've really walked that through, briefed that to your leadership and said, here's where this is going to, here's how I am going to help you. Um, the next step uh, is really, the, and this is where it is different, is really focusing in on uh, analyzing and understanding your audience. And this is where cultural knowledge, linguistic knowledge, um, general knowledge of how to, how to analyze demographics, intelligence um, and population-centric intelligence comes in, that's, that's huge. Um, you have to know de the demographic data cold. Um, and you have to, it has to be, you know, real. But then you also, to, you also have to take a look at things like language capability. You have to have the right language capability, not just speaking in the proper language. Modern Standard Arabic is great. Modern Standard Arabic with the right gender of speaker, the right tone, the right idiomatic uses. And by the way, MSA is a great language because words are used in one, words used in North Africa don't match words used in the Levant. So you've got to be really drilled down on that and language capability is essential. Um, and I can use a couple of, of examples of this. Um, uh, you know, first of all, on the gender issue, uh, as an aviator, you're probably familiar, um, the, the international language of, of aviation is English. But you got to realize that when you're trying to communicate in English um, with a Saudi air traffic controller, you probably don't want to use a female because he may not answer you. Um, and that is not a judgment on, on gender, um, you know, and, and gender equality. It's just a statement of fact. If you want to be effective, you're going to you, you need to use a male communicator, communicator voice. On the other hand, if you're trying to communicate with a female audience because that's your audience that you need to reach, oftentimes in these societies, that's the best voice to use and the best tone, using, of course, the, the correct uh, dialects and the correct tone as you move through. But then there's also the issue of culture. Um, and culture drives what works or doesn't work on an appeal. When I'm, when, I'm trying to, when I'm trying to convince you of something, I have to understand your culture to understand at the very heart what, you know, what's going to work. Um, oftentimes, it was, it was told us that, um, that uh, Western cultures tend to be um, very guilt-based in, in an appeal. A guilt-based appeal works in a Western culture, whereas a shame-based appeal works in, um, particularly in, in Arab cultures, where you, if, if, whereas don't expect me to inherently feel guilty about what I did. However, externally, if you shame me, that's a much more powerful appeal, depending upon where you're at. Whereas in a Western culture, an external shame-based appeal oftentimes causes shields to go up and people to uh, people to push back in such a way, and you become even more entrenched. So you have almost a, a, a um, an opposite view in those two areas. So understanding that culture is essential at, at the heart, but then also how how you're going to present that that appeal, making sure that you have the right references. You don't want to be, a, um, and this is both a linguistic and a culture example. You don't want to be Chevrolet or the General Motors and Chevrolet introducing a car. Uh, in Mexico called the Nova, because if you did, if you, A, if you understood the, the linguistic side of it, Nova in, in Spanish literally means no go. So um, you're selling a car that says that, you know, that you're brilliantly marketing as the new Chevy no go to, um, to a Spanish speaking audience, probably not the best uh, example of that and, uh, and making sure you lay that out properly. Um, then you also need to know uh, the key operational aspects of each audience. And that's, those are three things, susceptibility or capability, susceptibility, and vulnerability. Um, and these are, the, the, these are baked in oftentimes, it's very well entrenched in, in PSYOP um, uh, di or doctrine and practice, but capability is just simply thinking through what's the audience that can do what I want done. Um, it, it oftentimes an audience that you may have great reach into and you may be able to present an argument to, but they don't actually have the capability to do what you want. Um, therefore, you can expend a lot of effort communicating to those people, but they're not going to be able to get you where you want to be, um, objective-wise. Um, and so, you, but on the other hand, make sure you do identify, okay, these are the people that play a key role in that. And sometimes, once again, culture matters. Understanding that while externally in Iraq, it seemed like a very male-dominated patriarchal society, but when you went into the home, 
this, the oldest female in the house wielded significant power, particularly over the males that, that were her sons. Um, and that societally making an appeal to mothers in Iraq, actually, they were a strongly capable but hidden um, audience. And so figuring out that and identifying that and figuring out how to leverage it was important. Uh, so that plays into susceptibility, the means that you reach an audience by. Um, that's that is that's tied to the mediums. How do they, you know, what mediums do they do they use? Um, and when, you know, but more than that, when? Um, what are going to be the appeals? And a great example of this is um, radio in Afghanistan. If you want, if we wanted to reach Afghan women, we actually knew that radio radio usage by Afghan women went through the roof after 10 a.m. in the morning, and the reason why was because the the, the males would leave the house, the women would turn on the radio. And so when we were starting to work and place um, products and, and, and target them, the time to do that was really to focus on radio because that's what they had access to. And then after 10 p.m. to make sure that we were fully leveraging that susceptibility. Um, and then lastly is vulnerability. How do I appeal to you? And I'm gonna go back to the, um, the Iraqi mother example, which I, I know this sounds horrible, in a certain respect, but when we were trying to appeal in Iraq to to get mothers to to make sure that their sons did not participate um, in the violent organization or you know the the uh, violent or extremist organizations there, or, or frankly the resistance organizations that were the Iraqi resistance organizations that were there, um, you know, and uh, the, one of the reasons that Iraqi mothers wield so much power is because they're very they realize that their their future safety and stability relies upon their sons. Um, and so they keep a tight grip on them. And when you tell them, hey mom, uh, if your boy is out there planting IEDs or putting himself at risk and he gets, and the worst comes to pass, where are you? Um, and that's a blatant self-interest appeal, but it's also an appeal to, to help, to help you know, keep the young man from getting himself killed. But it works, it, you know, it worked in that, you know, focused on a key vulnerability of those, of that, hidden target audience to get them to become our best communicator in that Iraqi home. And that was absolutely essential as you really analyze and unpack a, um, uh, a, a, an audience and then build an effective influence appeal on that. With the, the rise of social media, that, is, that has grown and grown. You know, we, we, were, uh, we were talking a little while ago about kids with their, you know, with, you know that We've moved, you know, I, I talk about Facebook. My daughter's like, I don't use Facebook at, at all, dad. Um, and so now we have multiple mediums and how we see those things start getting, you know, adopted, understanding that Twitter may be great for one audience, but not really good and not leveraging it. I mean, we're now in the days where we have to, we, we have to be drilled down on that and understand it. Plus we have to have access to it. Um, it's essential and uh, once again, it drove one of the things we talked about when we were establishing the Jimwick is getting our, um, our, our, both our leadership and congressional leadership to understand that we had to have the ability to go wherever it was that our audiences were so we could hit those vulnerabilities, we could leverage that susceptibility and hit those vulnerabilities. Hey, Andy, if I could interject a question here uh, as you're going through this, because you brought up a, a, a really good topic that I was, question that I was thinking about as we went through. And that is, um, you know, where you're at and your understanding of the environment and your experience led you to a point where I think you're outpacing, uh, you've outpaced the leadership and your understanding of this dynamic and critical environment. So one, you know, how are we doing, right? I mean, I, 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 my sense is we're getting better, but, you know, I've been out of uniform now for a couple of years, but, you know, and, but, what do we need to change? Because you're, you're talking about a very dynamic, just in the mediums and how we communicate and the level of cultural expertise, which really haven't, in my experience in uniform in the soft community, weren't really appreciated like they should have been. And certainly not by me, right? So, you know, what do we need to do as leaders and what to navigate this and to be prepared to make these critical decisions in the IO realm in the future? Um, well, uh, the first, the first thing I'd say is I think actually, um, as leaders mature, 
there, you're, you're, you, you talked at the beginning about how you didn't, you came in without much uh, appreciation for uh, information operations, the, the real relevance that it drives, et cetera. That process that you went through um, of you know, going, holy smokes, at, particularly at the strategic level, um, high level operational strategic level, this is just critical. Uh, that tends to happen um, over, uh, it, it, you're not the only one that, that, that I've, uh, you know, leader that I've had that said, you know, I, I, I had no appreciation for how important this was. So I think one of the things we, we probably need to do is really drive home um, in, in almost, I would say in, in, at battalion and at, at brigade level now, because that's the, those are the growth medium for senior leaders in the military. Um, and the equivalents in all the services is drive this home in, in their PME. We have to get better at teaching folks that uh, um, that this is this is it now is the game. Um, we are we live in an age of pyrrhic victories. Um, we can operationally do things brilliantly, but if we don't capture the informational effect and win the informational side, then our operational brilliance is is absolutely going to be for naught. Um, and in fact, could be a net negative because the Somebody with less operational capability will spin that around uh, and will turn it against us and just portray it as either overreached by our nation or as a uh, as an actual failure. And so that's one of the things we've got to do. We the other parts is we've uh, I actually found the soft community and one of the reasons that I'm passionate about um, particularly psyop remaining in the soft community is because it was one of the easier places for me to convince. Um, uh, people that culture, um, that you know, culture matter. And uh, you don't, a career special forces officer doesn't have any trouble understanding that, you know, we need to win the the populace over or win the people that you're going to be working with over. Um, because oftentimes he was out there, you know, he started his career in an ODA somewhere um, where he was surrounded by um, the you know, the, the either the host nation's forces or uh, the insurgent forces that we were working with, or at least that's what he trained to. And um, influence is, is part and parcel to his understanding of, well, it, he had a really good reason to influence well, because otherwise he could find himself in, a, in some seriously deep hot water. So um, getting that through to, to, to soft leaders was, was not difficult, um, but we need to continue to really hammer it home uh, and the relevance of it. The last part is we've got to start resourcing it seriously. Um, and, and frankly, ultimately developing a cadre of senior leaders who come out of this field. It's not going away. Um, and in fact, it's, it's only becoming more and more relevant. And so um, actions like the establishment of the Jim Wick, that was, that was real and important. It was a concrete step showing that we, A, could appreciate that it mattered, and B, that we would put our money where our mouth was when we said it mattered. General Thomas uh, and General Clark after him have been have been true, truly revolutionary, and they're just their drive to get that done, um, and and not say not take no for an answer, not get guffed off until next year. Um, you know the Army is going through quite a bit on this. Um, they introduced a new concept called informational advantage, um, actually just a few weeks ago, uh, and I look at all of that with some interest because at least senior leaders are are, are grappling with the issues. But uh, I'm always concerned because we've had 14 different names in 15 years. You know, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, it's got to be more than an MSM idea. It's got to be, it's got to be something with concrete action behind it. And and the first place I've seen that happen is US SOCOM, and that's why I'm so proud to be an alumnus of, of SOCOM. They, they really did take it by the the bull by the horns and say, look, we're going to build something. And and you know, the Jimwick is not a small organ. It is not intended to be a small organization, nor is it intended to be a small bill. Um, it's real, um, and uh, and so those are the sorts of things where we need to be going. Every every commander needs to have in the back of his mind that information matters, um, and 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 then also be looking for now how do I leverage it? How do I protect myself and and my operations from being you know from any issues that might arise from it? Um, and then ultimately, when we're on our game, we'll be thinking two or three steps ahead. Yeah, and you want another question and and I couldn't agree more about the Jimwick, the Joint Use of Web Ops Center, as you know. I mean, I was uh, and and you know the interesting thing about that, that wasn't a mission that SOCOM dreamed up. 
that came, you know, that was one of the few instances where it was a top-down driven from OSD. Cape at OSD said, hey, we need to develop this. And, you know, it was also interesting to me that even though we had some bumps in the road at various levels with other agencies, Cybercom and things like that, at least at some level there was acknowledgement that this was was really a SOCOM was best suited for this mission. And I had some very uh, candid and frank discussions with General Fogarty on the issue when I was a J3. And he said, you know, and, and, and this is where we excel for a lot of the reasons that, that you just said. Um, one last question and then a roll up, but, you know, it, and, and I'll draw a bit of a parallel with the Special Ops Warrior Foundation, right? So we're, when we, when we have really developed our social media outreach and, you know, we're very efficient and we're out on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and, and all of those things every day. The more important or the more difficult thing is assessing effectiveness, right? So, you know, a bunch of thumbs up and likes and followings and all those kind of things. But, you know, for the Special Ops Warrior Foundation, does that translate into financial support? You know, certainly it does increase awareness, but, you know, how do you assess, you know, how do you assess the effectiveness of your, uh, of these IO programs and the PSYOPs? I mean, I, you know, I, I, it's always seems to be elusive to me. Um, probably my favorite question, you know, I, um, people tend to, like you said, likes, et cetera. My, my favorite quote in, in, in the, in the office always was, well, how many likes until you get a puppy? Um, I, I you know, I really want to know. Um, I, I remember a state department guy bragging to me about, well, do you realize how many times our, you know, our Facebook page at the U S embassy Addis has been liked? And I'm like, really? So, you know, when, how many likes? Do you need before you know you stop the fight the, you know, the fighting between you and Eritrea stops? Um, you, what's really essential, and, and and I used to tell my my teams this and my uh, and my organizations this all the time. You have to start at the beginning. You cannot think of assessment afterwards. If you don't plan to assess, you plan to guess, and that's the that's that is the, the bottom line. It has to be fused in. Um, the um, hang on one second here. Um, you ha really have to build that in. Uh, and so the, you, you focus on that. The other part is synchronized, synchronize your assessments. You have a variety of tools. Um, you have to separate your tools for assessment into two, really two big bins. The first is opinion, you know, because we are shaping opinions, perceptions, et cetera, attitudes, but then also you have behavior. And one of the hallmarks of behavior is it is observable. And so you have to you have to identify those tools that will let you observe it. So the first part is you know building in those on those interim objectives, building in things like focus groups, um, opinion polling, et cetera, and um, and building those pieces in um, so that they're synchronized and you can kind of measure if you've hit a, if you've hit a particular um, interim objective to a level that you can now move on. And start moving to the next more developed uh, opinion, attitude, or behavior that all, or opinion and attitude that ultimately leads to that behavior. At the second time, you've got to have the the intelligence capabilities so that you can see when the behavior happens. Um, there's a really super um, example of this uh, that occurred in the invasion during the invasion of uh, Iraq uh, back in in 2003. As we were getting as we're going getting. Uh, prepared, we were really working over with more traditional PSYOP means most of the Iraqi frontline units that were facing, um, that were facing to the south towards Kuwait. And we were hitting them with leaflets oftentimes, but also some message, radio messaging to their commanders. What we were seeking was capitulation, not surrender. Um, and that was a, a, a very important operational reason for that, in that if you if they surrendered we had a we had a huge logistic problem that we had to deal with if they just capitulated and held in place we could move around them and can continue to move so ultimately though what happened what we started we we had a, a lot of brainstorming went on what do we do that so that we know they've capitulated and what they ultimately came up with for the tank units was put your tanks in a square in a square formation gun tubes facing in there is 
having been a, you know, started my career as a tanker, there is no operational reason you would ever do that. Um, unless the entire unit decided to commit suicide simultaneously. Um, so the, but, so that was though observable. And all we needed was one overhead flight. Somebody looks down and goes, are they in, are they in a square formation? Yeah, which way are their gun tubes facing? Inside. Okay, that's, in, that's communication, that's behavior, and that's essential. Building that in, we knew exactly that, the, the, that that influence activity had worked. The same thing has to be in place otherwise. And sometimes it will be, you know, SIGINT so that you've got SIGINT poised to start picking up messaging from an adversary to know that a mill deck has effectively taken or that they bit on the deception story. Or it could be, you know, looking at, you know, being in position with, um, with human to know that people are starting to take an action in a particular place that you're driving for. That's the, the crux of that, um, of, of assessing effectively. But it all starts with good planning. IO plans, I, and I'll put this out there, IO plans are really not any harder to assess than, or than traditional military operations. You just have to think about it a little bit more and then have your stuff in place to, to, uh, to make it happen. Wow, this has been fascinating. Uh, yeah, I know we're getting close on time here a little over. What, uh, any closing thoughts, Andy, before I wrap it up and pass it over back over to Brian? Um, just one really is that, uh, you know, I, I, admittedly, I throw this out there and this is really, I mean, I, I know it seems like a lot of this is complex, very specialized stuff. But one of the things is that one of, one of the successful things that has occurred is the integration of IO professionals, particularly when units deploy very deep um, into, into organizations, all the way down off, you know, always to the brigade, frequently to the battalion level, um, speaking in army terms. Um, but Really, one of the things I would tell leaders is find those guys and challenge them. I didn't become, you know, going into MBS was great. But that didn't make me um, an effective IO planner, uh, a PSYOP and IO planner. Uh, what, what did was uncompromising leaders who wouldn't accept a second rate answer from me and really drove me to produce the best piece. That's the thing that I, you know, the advice that I would, uh, um, would give to uh, military leaders who are looking at this, or even leaders who are in, in the civilian side who have some form of engagement office, a marketing office, et cetera. You know, drive them to, to explain how they're going to apply their competencies to support your organization's mission or objectives, and then always, always, always force them to tell you how they're gonna measure it. And you're gonna, you're gonna see success with information operations because you'll have thought about it and you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be in position to really take advantage of it. Andy, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's uh, it, it seems no matter what the topic, uh, it all comes down to leadership. You know, and uh, leader uh, organizations take on the values and priorities of their leaders. Um, and and I do agree with you. I do think we are we are embracing this uh, in a way we have never done in the past. We've seen the operational impacts of not embracing it. Um, but it is a dynamic environment and, and it is truly a journey, not a destination, you know, with regards to all the aspects that you talked about with regards to the tools and the speed and the assessment and all those things. And the, the professional military development of future generations of military leaders that, so they're equipped and prepared and appreciate this uh, dynamic environment that we find ourselves in. So listen, uh, thanks very much. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, it brings back memories of sitting around that round table in my office and, uh, and, and use uh, counseling me on, uh, on information operations and reminding me what a uh, neophyte I really was in that area. So thanks very much. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Brian for a wrap up. Yeah, well. Uh, thank you, Major General Hamacher, and uh, and Colonel Zachary, thank you so much. Uh, really, just great job overall, and and certainly, um, you know, for the simpletons, Marines like myself, uh, uh, summarizing the you know the just the purpose and application of I/O um, at the top level really, um, I think, puts it in some context that makes it easy to to digest. Um, and where to start? Uh, you know, your top level breakdown from recognizing kind of the rapid shift in tech. Uh, and it's front and center role and influence. I think the, uh, uh, certainly thinking about the availability of tools that leverage and are leveraged by IO and 
and how inexpensive they are and abundant um, they are for everyone in the world. Um, the information op tempo, I think is the way you put it, the ubiquitous sensors, you know, all these things play into that top level, you know, understanding of what, what we do with IO moving forward. Um, and I really, I loved your, some, some of your fan, uh, fabulous insight on, you know, the linguistic aspect, the, the gender and cultural impacts, the nuances on, on IO campaigns and how important they are to have, you know, in your, in your toolkit uh, to be effective going forward. So, um, and obviously the need to resource IO seriously. Um, and I, and I think I agree the, you know, through the soft elements that can handle them. I mean, if that's, that's the way we've trained these, these units to be able to handle these types of situations. So an IO, an IO empowered soft leader certainly brings the opportunity to success. And I think uh, I'll agree with you on that as well. Um, I did love the reference to the puppet shows and, and bringing in lyrics from the boy in the bubble. Um, certainly uh, hearkening back to my days on a couple of deployments myself, I had an, an actual cassette tape of uh, that album with the boy in the bubble and lasers in the jungle. And I'll echo, these are days of miracle and wonder. And this is long distance call. It's just such, so fitting to the discussion on IO. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's actually that song, the more I was thinking about it, as you said, that brings so much uh, uh, kind of clarity to wh where we sit today with respect to IO, um, almost ironically. Um, and anyway, so I think, and the enlightened point you made about the physical action, um, you know, if it's to send a message, if your intent is to send a message, it's still an IRC. And I don't think, you know, certainly with my uh, rock headedness, that actually had occurred to me before that physical action is kinetic, you know, and I think the way you brought that in really, um, it's important for us to think about those types of things as information related capabilities, not necessarily just uh, the kinetic focus. Um, so anyway, so I, again, I, for all that and my, uh, certainly my bumbling way of summarizing all of your articulate uh, points, I very much thank you. I think it was a brilliant, brilliant session. Um, so thanks again. And, uh, and Major General Clay Hutmacher, thank you as always for your insightful questions and the background you bring to these great discussions. Uh, certainly your background in, in IO, um, your specific background there brings so much value to this and the gym link, et cetera. Um, so thank you again. And we look forward to the next one that I hope you'll host for us as well. And, uh, and thank you all for watching. I hope these conversations continue to inform and inspire you. Until the next Mission Essential Conversation, stay, sa stay safe and stay healthy. Mm -hmm.